Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. My name is Amjad Mahmood Khan. I'm a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and I also serve as co-chair of the Congressional Advocacy Day here at Capitol Hill in connection with the International Religious Freedom Summit. And on behalf of the summit co-chairs, Dr. Katrina Lantos-Sweat and Ambassador Sam Brownback and all of the organizers of this amazing summit, uh, I extend greetings to all of you. Thank you so much for coming to this program. I'm honored once again to welcome you to our fourth annual In Solidarity with the Persecuted event. We hold this event to cap our special day of advocacy on Capitol Hill in connection with the International Religious Freedom Summit. Just today, nearly 200 delegates briefed over 150 congressional offices on a number of issues affecting international religious freedom. We represent, this movement represents many faith traditions, but today we came united as one. And as part of this movement, which is global, we advocate for the rights of each other as much as our own. In fact, we are a voice for others. And by showing that common humanity, we are then stronger as an international religious freedom movement, and therefore international religious freedom is stronger. It's hard to actually put in words just how diverse this movement is and just how diverse this room is this evening. And part of what we wanted to showcase this year is showing that diversity, not just in word, but in deed and in action. We convene, as everyone knows, amidst grave events in the world. The conflict in Gaza, in particular, has generated deep divides across faith communities. And we witness incalculable and unbearable human suffering and tragedy around us. But in such circumstances, the perception for many people in the world is that religion and that religious differences have become a force that divides humanity. Indeed, interfaith work faces its greatest test today. And for this reason, we've assembled a diverse array of religious leaders and experts to tackle this very question. What are the enduring models for interfaith peace building and reconciliation at a time of great conflict? By showing solidarity with the persecuted communities, what we mean by that solidarity is to recognize and negotiate, yes, negotiate, our different points of view. And, dare I say, transcend those differences to achieve true religious freedom for everyone and everywhere. And so to that end, I'm delighted to invite our first speaker to open this session and it is the U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, Rashad Hussain. He serves as this, in this position as the principal advisor to the Secretary of State, Secretary Blinken, and advisor to President Biden on religious freedom conditions and policy. He leads the department's efforts to monitor religious freedom abuses, persecution, and discrimination worldwide. And he also oversees policies and programs to address these concerns and works to build diverse and dynamic partnerships with the broadest range of civil society, including all of the 90 partners of this International Religious Freedom Summit. And he does so with equitable and meaningful inclusion of faith actors globally. We're delighted to have Ambassador Rashad Hussein. Thank you so much. Good afternoon to all of you. I was just speaking with our, our friends from Argentina, and uh, in addition to all the 
incredible work that they're doing, the groundbreaking work that they're doing. Uh, they have the Pope and they have the World Cup. So that, that's pretty strong. And there you go. <laughs> so thank you for everything that you're doing. And thank you to uh, Ambassador Brownback and to Dr. Alenta Sweat for your leadership, doing this important work on a bipartisan basis as Congress envisioned uh, with the IRF Act in 1998. Ambassador Brownback, I have to say, has just been an incredible leader, uh, my predecessor in this position, following on the great work of Ambassador David Saperstein. And uh, he uh, started the ministerial and saw the important need to consider the work of the ministerial at the civil society level. So we continue the work of the ministerial. We were in the Czech Republic, I know many of you were there, uh, but we have to have civil society. And all of the work that I've done in my time in public service, there's never been an assignment that I've had in which civil society cooperation uh, was more important. And more than ever, uh, as we've already heard, the work of engaging with religious actors is absolutely critical. We are at a very perilous time uh, in our world, and we can't sugarcoat that in any way. We are at a time when there is growing repression uh, in human rights and including religious freedom uh, around the world, yet we are also at a time where we see a greater movement uh, to address those challenges, which is represented by all of you here. And it's going to take every single one of you, and it's going to take us all working together, and it's not something that we're going to solve overnight, but we have to continue, even when it's most difficult, even on the most emotional, sensitive, pressing issues, uh, as we see now in the Middle East after such unacceptable uh, and just unbelievable, devastating loss of life uh, that we've seen. Uh, I do believe that as I travel around the country, and I was just in Los Angeles with the second gentleman, Douglas Emhoff, uh, and we were meeting with uh, Muslim and Jewish leaders there. At the local level, there's a lot of incredible work that's going on, and we need to model that and follow that and lead on that from Washington, D.C. as well, uh, because oftentimes our, our communication, our engagement, uh, too often happens in silos, but it's, it's past time that we get people together, as we've done today, uh, and we have uh, people talking through even the most sensitive issues. And the reason why we're able to do that is because of the work that's happened uh, over the years. You can't just wake up one morning and create these types of relationships. They're built on work that, is a, that, is, that has uh, really been part of a concerted effort uh, to bring people together, and we really need that uh, more than ever. In addition to bringing reconciliation uh, between religious communities, it is critical that we have religious actors working to address some of the most pressing challenges that we're facing as humanity. We're coming out of a global pandemic in which the voices of religious actors were essential in addressing vaccine hesitancy, for example. We have the challenges of development around the world, addressing extremism around the world, the challenge, uh, the the, the existential challenge of climate change, which we're seeing uh, now uh, almost every day uh, around the world. Uh, so we need all of us to come together, uh, to work together, uh, as the leaders uh, today are, as you are, as at the at the uh, Earth Summit, and to continue uh, to to do this uh, work. Uh, I know that it seems difficult and that religion is oftentimes given a bad rap. But the, the truth of the matter is that religion is a powerful force for good, and it must continue to be a force for good. And the people that follow uh, their religious convictions with sincere intent to improve the lives of uh, people around them, those are the majority of people around the world that are moving us forward. And sure, there may be some in the minority that use religion as a political tool or use religion to yield power over others. And that's not the true essence of the teaching of any of the great faiths. So we have to reclaim that mantle uh, and make sure that we're coming together around all that unites us, even though there are differences that we don't want to gloss over. But we come together with a common purpose uh, and a common mission, especially at a time when we face so many challenges. So thank you all for everything that you're doing, not just this week, but for all the work that you're doing in all of your countries uh, around the world. And we look forward uh, to continuing these essential partnerships with all of you. Thank you so much. We're really grateful, Ambassador, for you to spare time on such a busy schedule. Thank you again for those remarks. 
I invite our co-chair for the International Religious Freedom Summit for 2024, Dr. Katrina Lantos-Sweat, to please uh, join us here on the head table. Uh, she is not only one of the, the co-chairs of the summit, and Ambassador Brownback is here as well, here in the front. He, she serves as president of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, which was established in 2008 to continue the legacy of her father, the late Congressman Tom Lantos. Um, she also serves as co-chair of the board of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea and is on the advisory board of UN Watch, uh, the annual Anne Frank Award and lecture, and the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Policy. Um, I'm sure most people in this room have met Katrina and we're delighted to have her share some remarks now. Thank you so much, Amjad, and, and thanks to Ambassador Hussein for his wonderful remarks. I always feel a special blessing when I'm with my friends from the Ahmadi community. I think they embody um, everything we talk about as part of the international religious freedom movement. Um, deep conviction, deep courage in the way they live out their faith, but an incredible spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood, of respect and inclusion, and um, I know I have so much to learn from them, and I, I truly love that community um, in a very special way. You know, I, I appreciated the remarks of Ambassador Hussein. They underscore just what a difficult moment it is we are living through. And the danger always when we find ourselves in moments of great threat and great stress and great difficulty is that we let go of the values that are at the very heart of who we are as individuals and who we hope to be as a society. And the annual Earth Summit, the um, Congressional Advocacy Day, the work of the Earth Roundtable, all of us are determined with every fiber of our being not to allow us to to let go of those profound values, to leave them behind, to shrug them off, to, to somehow say, well, it's just too difficult of a moment. Things have gotten too hard. There's too much conflict, too much struggle, too much war in the world, and we, we just have to take to our barricades. We must not do that. You know, I, I think about the difference between, and most of us, many of us here in this room today are people of faith, of some sort of faith. And faith, as again, as Ambassador Hussein said, can be an enormous tonic in society, strengthening communities, building bridges, doing just incredible good works. But of course, we often also hear that other narrative that says, oh no, People of faith, that's a toxin. That's kind of a poison in society that is driving people apart and is, is tearing communities apart and, and feeding, feeding differences. And, uh, you know, obviously I believe that it is a tonic and not a toxin, but I think that part of the key to making sure that faith communities and individual people of faith remain a source of that kind of blessing and benevolence for society has to do with the way we live our faith. I saw a quote, and I don't know who to attribute it to, but I thought it was very insightful. It said that certainty is too often wearing the robe of arrogance, but conviction properly wears a cloak of humility. I think each of us need to strive to be people of conviction, sincerely, honestly, determinedly living out those convictions. But without that sort of smug, overweening certainty that causes us to put on uh, a robe of arrogance and to judge or dismiss or try to, in some way, evaluate ourselves in reference to others. We're, we're going down, I think, a wrong path when we go in that direction. Um, to me, one of the great examples of sort of the spirit of universal 
brotherhood and that sense of the responsibility for being one bro one's brother's keeper is to me very much exemplified in the life of Raoul Wallenberg. Some of you have, may have heard me talk earlier today about this remarkable Swedish diplomat who came to Hungary at the height of the Holocaust uh, with one mission, and that was to try and save and rescue as much of the surviving Hungarian Jewish community as possible. And both of my parents were young teenagers, my mother only 12, my father a couple of years older, and they were among those whom he saved. But what is, there are many, many remarkable things about his life and his work and his mission. But one of the things I want to underscore is that he had nothing in common with the people he came to save and to rescue. He was Swedish. They were Hungarian. He was rich. He came from one of those most powerful families in Sweden. They were the Rockefellers of Sweden. Most of the people he came to help were poor and persecuted and barely holding on. He was a Christian, and they were Jews. But what he saw was their common humanity. He saw them as his brothers and sisters. And that vision, that set of glasses through which he looked at these poor, struggling people, barely holding on to life, changed everything. So I'd like to close um, with a wonderful story by a rabbi. So rabbi, I don't know if you've heard this one, but it was one of my late father's favorites. And it's about a rabbi who gathers his students around him. And he says, OK, I have a question for you. How can you tell the precise moment when the night has turned to day? Well, his students thought, and one says, Rabbi, Rabbi, is it if when you're walking home through the village at night towards your home and you see an animal coming towards you, you can tell the difference between a wolf and a dog? Is that the moment when the light has dawned? He said, no. Nope. It's an interesting answer, but no. Then another student said, well, Rabbi, what if you're walking through the village to your home at night and there's enough light that you can distinguish the roof line of your house from the one of your neighbor. And again, the rabbi shook his head. And he said, I will tell you when it is that you will know that the night has turned to day. When you are walking down the street and you see a stranger coming toward you and in his face you recognize a brother. That's when we'll know that the night has turned to day. When we see a stranger, when we see someone from a community, a country, a people, a nation, a faith, not our own, and we recognize in their face a brother, a sister, someone who we have a responsibility towards. Uh, that is what this movement is about. That is what this panel is about. And I know that that's a, a vision all of you carry in your heart. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Katrina, for those uh, very thoughtful words, as always. Today's format is very unique. We're going to have three panels, and uh, we're going to have eight speakers. Um, and so the thought behind this format is to have a conversation. To have a conversation with people who are in the field, who have dedicated their lives for this work, who have transcended religious differences and created such unity that now these movements are growing to create lasting and enduring peace. These, dare I say, can be models models that can be replicated in other parts of the world, perhaps. Perhaps it might be a struggle. Perhaps it might be easy in certain parts of the world. But nevertheless, models that can have real value to solve some of the most vexing problems of the world and achieve real peace. And so to that end, um, I wanted to introduce our first set of panels on my left, panelists on my left. And this is a panel that will focus for about 15 or 20 minutes on the work that's happening actually in Israel, between and among faith traditions. In this 
case, not all the faith traditions that we could represent tonight, but at least the great Abrahamic faiths. And these three individuals have tremendous reputations, reputations for being some of the most thoughtful leaders on this subject and some of the most impactful workers and leaders in Israel. So I would like to first just provide a little bit of background on each speaker and then start posing some questions to them to have a conversation. The first speaker is Rabbi Aharon Ariel Levi. Rabbi Levi is known as a serial social entrepreneur, a professional community organizer, and a thinker who believes Judaism can inspire and inform all walks of life. Rabbi Levi is managing director of Our, Our Torah Interfaith Center and co-founder of Hakel, the first global incubator for Jewish intentional communities, which was awarded the Jerusalem Unity Prize in 2020. He lives with his wife and their five children next to the Gaza border and has worked in that space, including working in Haifa with our next speaker, whose name is Amir Muhammad Sharif Ode. Muhammad Sharif Ode is the Amir of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the Holy Land based in Haifa, which maintains a very unique and long-standing presence in both Israel and the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Gaza. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community has had members in this region since 1928, and in 1934, the first mosque was erected in Haifa, and close to it, spiritual and cultural institutions were also established, and that mosque, which is there now, was rebuilt to a much larger mosque. That's the current mosque in 1979. And our final speaker on this panelist to my left is Archbishop Anba Angelus. Archbishop Angelos is the first Coptic Orthodox Archbishop of London. He comes all the way from the UK since November 2017 in this position, widely recognized for his extensive advocacy work. And as a result, he was conferred the honor of Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen for services to international religious freedom. His eminence works to facilitate the support of and assistance to those in greatest need and suffering persecution and displacement and has an impact on this region as well. So great panel here. So it's, it's very rare to have leaders who are actually from the region working in this space here in, on Capitol Hill. And so I wanted to take this opportunity here in the introduction. Perhaps I can uh, begin with you, uh, Amir Ode. And that is, we have seen the work uh, of your community leading, bringing people together from different faith traditions in Israel. Would you describe from your perspective how this work is progressing right now during a time of grave conflict and perhaps uh, Rabbi Levi, you can also answer that question. Okay. I also would like to add that Amir uh, Ode uh, speaks Hebrew and Arabic and English, but he may be comfortable speaking, speaking in Arabic, and if so, we have uh, his translator, Osama Avan here, who will, who will quickly summarize his points. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الدين الذي لا يعلم أتباعه حب الإنسانية ليس بدين. The religion that does not teach love of mankind to the entire the entire followers is not a religion at all. نحن نؤمن بأن القرآن الكريم يبدأ بالآية الحمد لله رب العالمين. فالرب هو الذي يهتم بخلقه وهك الأم التي تهتم بأولادها تهتم بإطعامهم تهتم بتربيتهم تهتم بتنميتهم فهكذا الله يهتم بكل خلقه ف 
فإذا كنت أؤمن بمثل هذا الإله لابد أن أهتم بكل خلقي We know that the Quran starts with the words Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen that Allah is the one, all praise belongs to Allah who is Lord of all the worlds and so the, the, Rab, the word Rabb means that he is the one who nurtures and develops all of his creation, not just a specific creation, just like a mother feeds and trains and, and nurtures her children and, um, and so if I believe in such a Lord, if I believe in a God such as this who is the Lord of all the worlds then I have to be also have the same sympathy towards all of creation, not just a select group of people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqool al-khalq kulluhum iyalullah ahabbahum ila Allah Rasulullah lam yaqool al-arabi wa lam yaqool al-muslim bal qal ahabbahum ila Allah huwa ahabbahum أو أنفعهم لخلقه أي لجميع البشر. The Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم peace be upon him has said that all of creation is the children of Allah metaphorically is the children of Allah and the most the most beloved to God Himself is the one that is most beneficial to this creation. He did not say the Arab or the Muslim but the one that benefits mankind the most is the most beloved to God Himself. فمع كل الظروف الصعبة في الديار المقدسة في إسرائيل وفلسطين لأن هناك ثقة متبادلة بيننا وبين اليهود وبين المسيحيين وبين المسلمين فعندما ندعو الجميع لاجتماع فالجميع يحضر لأنهم يعرفون أن هناك ثقة متبادلة بيننا وأن هناك حب في قلوبنا للجميع and so his experience, his current experience in Israel, in the Holy Land, is that when he invites, or when the Jamaat there invites Christians, uh, Jews, they all uh, receive that call and do attend the programs that are held because they have trust in the community and that ha they have that love that, that they know that we have that love for them as well. <laughs> دعونا وكان أول اجتماع يجتمع فيه العرب واليهود معا هو كان في مركزنا في حيفا. The first, uh, the first meeting between Jews and Muslims after October 7th was actually in Haifa, uh, at the masjid in, in Haifa. وهكذا نحن استمرنا إلى اجتماعات عديدة ومتكررة كيف نبني الثقة للمستقبل. And so we have continued on having these these conferences at our mosque um, on a recurring basis since October 7th uh, to continue this conversation. And this is not a new thing. We've before, Even before October 7th, we have been inviting people on a regular basis, continual basis. And and so as religious leaders, as Muslims, as Christians, as Jews, we travel and we go to different universities and schools uh, to, to show the, the, that uh, the, the peaceful teachings and the coexistence is possible. And, and so that we can learn from one another as well. Does this work? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much, for, for, first of all, for inviting me. As uh, Amjad said, I live on the Gaza border. I was there on October 7th. Uh, as a medic, I took care of the wounded, and I saw it uh, up front. So first of all, I'd like to extend maybe a, a word of prayer for the healing of the wounded and the release of the hostages and the end of suffering on both sides. I have friends inside Gaza as well, which I'm trying to help, and it's super complicated. Um, now, from our perspective as interfaith uh, activists or workers or thinkers, uh, on the one hand, this is the most difficult time for us. Like people, as was said in the beginning, like, how is this relevant? Like there's war, how, how, how is interfaith work even relevant at this point? On the other hand, I think this is the most important time for interfaith work, and I think we can and should hopefully play a decisive role in this process. Because from, first of all, I totally identify with what my friend uh, Amir Ode said, about the process on the ground, there are conversations, there are interfaith dialogue uh, events going on. 
But I would like to, to take a moment to look at the, at the broader perspective and say that what my understanding and my colleagues' understanding is that what, what Hamas and Hezbollah and as proxies of Iran are, are trying to do is to take a local conflict that has some religious aspects and transform it into a full-fledged global religious war that has a local front which they manage. And I think that this is a trap that we should not fall into. And um, because agents of chaos actually, that's their purpose. They, 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 they thrive in those situations. And we as agents of, of stability and peace and sustainability need to counterweight um, in some point. The problem is that I see too many people, also on my side, in the Jewish Orthodox world, who are actually falling into this, into this trap and are saying things like, and again, I repeat this, uh, quoting other people. It's not the rabbi saying, he's saying this. They uh, say things like, uh, oh, all Muslims are, are like this, or we should uh, declare war on the entire Muslim world, which is both ridiculous but, and, and, and dangerous, but uh, first and foremost, it's it just, such a flawed understanding of reality and such a flawed understanding of, of Islam. I just bought the Hebrew version of the Quran from uh, my friend uh, a few months ago. Um, so besides the work we do between us, there's a lot of work we need to do also inside. And uh, so the, the institution I lead, the Ortoa Interfaith uh, Center, our goal is both to be in conferences like this and in conversations with, I mean, with Imam Talib Sharif, with people in many other countries, which I cannot always mention their names uh, for obvious reasons. But we also do a lot of work inside the Jewish people, in Israel and abroad, educating people about other religions. We have a think tank of rabbis who study Quran and are actually building, giving us the building blocks I can have a deep conversation with my Muslim friends beyond just peace, love, tolerance, and I'm all for peace, love, tolerance, don't get me wrong, but we, we can and should go deeper than that and actually have, a, have a deeper discussions. So if you ask me, I think that's the, epicenter of the interface dialogue right now, that's where we should be uh, heading. Deep understanding dialogue and uh, understanding our world at this time. Thank you, Rabbi Levi and uh, Amir Saab Odeh. I mean, this is really tremendous work and both of them work together as with many other leaders in Haifa as a model. Uh, Bishop Angelos, I'm gonna get you in this conversation. Um, you've spent your life demonstrating the power of interfaith collaboration. And I'm gonna ask you a tough question because I know you, you give very thoughtful answers. How does this work survive? When the world feels like religious communities are more, the, more divided than ever, how can we change that perception? Thank you, Amgad. And um, while I am absolutely thrilled that we are all here, I wish we didn't have to meet. Um, because if we were just able to do what we do as religious leaders and then people of faith, people of conviction, the world would become better rather than us having to work against negativity. But, but, I, but I think you're very right. It's very easy to find scapegoats. Um, it's interesting that for every generation, its tragedy always seems the worst. If we look back at, at history, we have gone through much darker times, times of much greater conflict and times of much more painful uh, division. The fact that we are here today, I think, means that we have moved and we are in a better place. But the, the important thing to remember is, is, I think, for us as people of faith, is to realize, and this is something I realized myself, that. There is no monopoly on suffering. All our communities suffer somewhere. And everywhere, we may be a majority, but we're also a minority somewhere else. And unless we live in the space of others and walk in the shoes of others, we will never genuinely feel their pain. And so we will never be able to genuinely advocate for them. Um, being from a, a church that has faced persecution for 2,000 years, ever since our first martyr was the founder of the church, St. Mark the Evangelist. And in my mind, being in London, 
I thought it was a wonderful opportunity, and I see wonderful partners. I, I, I see Fiona Bruce, who's the now Prime Minister, Special Envoy for uh, Freedom of Religion or Belief, and Sir Charles Hoare, who's doing a lot of work with uh, the once Bishop of Truro with the Prura Review, um, and now the my dear brother, Bishop Philip Mount Stephen, the Bishop of, of Winchester. I found an opportunity for us to establish an office to advocate for people of all faiths and religions using our own experience and not desiring that to happen to anyone else. So with the Ahmadiyya community, of course, we do a lot of work in London. With the Baha'i community, uh, with the Uyghur community, with the Rohingya community, and so on and so forth. Because, you know, and, and I, I'm very thankful to, to Katrina for having quoted Genesis, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is yes. Of course we're our brother's keeper, our sister's keepers. Of course we are responsible because this is our world, our humanity. You know, Nelson Mandela made a very important quote and he said, the legacy we present is the world we leave for our children. So what world are we leaving to our children? Um, I, I, I feel like an imposter here because I, I don't serve in the Holy Lands but I was, I was in Jerusalem two weeks before October 7. Um, and, and, and I know the, the pain because our community is there. But one thing, uh, one short experience I'll share with you is shortly after the, uh, the October 7 attack and then the bombing in Gaza, um, I went into a, a cafe in London and there was a lady there with a, a, an identifiably Palestinian accent. And so I spoke with her, and she was, she was Muslim. And I asked about her and her family, and she said yes, she'd lost about 30 members of her own family. And then I was in our parish just a day later. We've got a parish in a very Orthodox Jewish community. And as I walked back, I saw someone who was dressed as an Orthodox Jew, and I stopped him, and I asked if he was ethnically Israeli, and he said no. And I just asked, but how's your community dealing with this? And he said that because it's such a tight-knit community, you know, some of his own family members were affected and others had community members who were affected. The point is that here was I as a Christian engaging with a Muslim woman who had suffered because her family had suffered and a Jewish man who was suffering because his family and his community has suffered. And that is the nature of our of our community. If we were probably 50 years ago, 100 years ago, living in our ethnic silos, where a Coptic Christian would only live in Egypt, and other people would only see people of the same kind, of the same race, of the same religion, that may have been acceptable. I was born in Egypt, migrated with my family to Australia when I was five, went back to Egypt, and now have a serving in England for 30 years. I interact with people of all faiths and none. We can no longer have a siloed view, but we must be able to live in that common space. Very deep reflections. Bishop Angelas, thank you for those comments. I'm gonna go one, one more round with this panel before I shift to Argentina. And I thought maybe it might make sense for each of you to describe for the people in this room, what is what is one thing that they can do, the people in this room, to carry forward the work of peace building across faiths in the Holy Land? First of all, we, want to, uh, we must build a trust between each other. If, we, if there are trust, and after that we can build peace and everything else. We love each other, not from only talking, to feel the pain of the other people. When I visit uh, Poland, Oichwitz, uh, Kornako, Bornako? Birkenau, Birkenau. 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 In one place, I start cry. I told myself, if you didn't cry, you have problem with your humanity. And when they killed the two, uh, one rabbi, Habad rabbi in Bombay, bombing, and I saw the photo of Moshe with uh, one a lady, Indian lady, and he said in the, in the newspaper they wrote, 
mother. Ima, in Hebrew is Ima. And I start cry, I was in the train between Haifa to Tel Aviv. And also again, I told myself, if you, Sharif, you didn't cry for this, the pain of this boy, you have problem with uh, your humanity. That means we must feel the pain of all the human being in Haifa, in Tel Aviv, in Kfar Gaza, in Gaza, in Africa, in Europe. All the boys, they are equal, no different between the category of the boys. All the boys, they are boys. We must love all the human being. This is what our motto, love for all, hatred <laughs> for none. الحب للجميع ولا كراهية لأحد. So I will say briefly. Um, on one level, there's obviously you know solidarity and and continuing the, the dialogue. But I think one point that sometimes we miss in this field, and maybe uh, it's not not always nice to talk about it. So in, in, in the Bible, there are about 43 prophecies about peace. And I'd like to say this is the, the first ancient text that actually laid out this vision of having a peaceful world uh, sometime in the, in the future. Uh, but before any of those prophecies, the Bible also speaks about, first of all, uh, eradicating or, or minimizing or moving away from, from evil. So in, in Psalms uh, 34, 15, it says, I'll say it in Hebrew first, it says, Sur mera tov, we're going to test each other on the Bible and the Quran <laughs> later. Um, it, which means, Sur Mera means move away from evil and do good, ask for peace and chase it. Need, so first of all, peace is something that has to be, you have to be active about. You can't just, oh, let's lay back and wait for peace to just come from heavens. That's not the guidance, I think, of, of at least my tradition. Uh, you, need, you need to be active about uh, getting peace. But in order to do that, a precondition is you need to move away from, from evil. And I think that one thing we can do, and everyone here can do, is uh, really first of all make, make, make the distinction between what is good and bad in, in, uh, in the world, and then cling to the good and try to promote it. Uh, as I said earlier, against the forces we're, we're standing against are not uh, by the way, some of them are also Jewish. It's, it's, it's a whole mix of chaos agents uh, who misinterpret mis in, mis our own traditions. And to counterbalance that, it's not enough just to say, oh, we're just going to have, uh, uh, just love, peace, and love. Uh, we have to say this as well, but we also have to, be, to go deeper and, and find the real connecting points between Judaism and Islam and Christianity and other traditions, uh, learn each other, get to know each other, and, and create a counterweight which has intellectual and ideological uh, gravitas and, and, and weight to it, and not, not it has to be more, more deep. I think that's, the, that's my main point. And in building this uh, coalition of peace promoters. Thank you. Um, I, I think the first thing we can do is admit to the complexity of the situation and realize that there are no easy solutions, and realize that there is suffering on every side. I'm not gonna say both sides, because there aren't just two sides. Right. <laughs> so everyone just says both sides. There is suffering on every side, and there is mourning and bereavement on every side, and there is trauma on every side. And we just need to con confess to ourselves that that is the truth, because everyone is trying to be quite edgy and forward thinking and find just the right sound bite in our 280 characters to make a statement that is going to impact the world. And if it were just that easy, we would have found a solution. But it's not that easy. And I think if we're able to say that everyone is grieving and everyone needs a solution, that's really important. And I, you know, to, to realize that I don't just have to be siding with one side or one group of people, but you know, I, I've heard my brothers speak about the importance of humanity and humaneness. You know, I've, I've said time and time again, although there are many things enshrined in international treaties and international law, with all due respect, the importance of the sanctity of life 
and human dignity are enshrined in our holy books first and foremost. You know, treaties and laws are an afterthought. And finally, occupational hazard, I am going to quote scripture, I'm really sorry. And it's from the book of Micah where, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? And that is to do justly for all, to love mercy for all, and to walk humbly knowing that we need to have that connection to all and realize that all are God's people in one way or another. And we need to have a responsibility as sisters and brothers to safeguard God's people. Thank you. Um, and please join me in thanking this very stellar panel. I'm sure we can go on with, with this discussion. Really just terrific to have the three of you here. I'm just going to turn to our dear um, Rabbi Miguel Stuerman and uh, Imam Marvan Gill now. And um, this is a really amazing story. It's an amazing story of two brothers that have come together. Rabbi Miguel Stuerman is director of the Latin American Jewish radio station, Radio Jai. And Imam Marvan Gill is the president of the Amdi Muslim community in Argentina. They're co-founders of the nation's first Jewish Muslim Brotherhood which was praised by Pope Francis for its ongoing efforts, insisting that they represent, quote, the way forward, doing things together, not arguing. Shalom Salam is their radio program. Uh, we have both of them here. And um, I guess I'll start with uh, uh, Imam Marvan. How did this happen? How did you come together? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, shalom, peace be upon you. Uh, first of all, I would like to offer my thanks to Catherine, to Sam, and all team involved. I think when we started our Shalom Salam almost three years ago, we would have never imagined in such a small time, not just visiting the Pope, the Caliph, the Chief Rabbi, but now also being here with you. Um, so it started back um, when I was uh, invited. Um, as you might be aware, that Argentina had two, has suffered two terror attacks against the Jewish community. And um, it was the first time that I, in my position as the Imam of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, attended an event, an interfaith event organized by the Israeli embassy. So when they invited me and I spoke there, I clarified that for me it's very clear uh, because the holy founder of Islam has taught us to respect the sanctity of all human beings. It's an anecdote about uh, a narration that a Jewish group were carrying the dead body of a person to the cemetery and the Holy Prophet stood up to express his respect. And one of his disciples asked him, but this person wasn't even a Muslim, so why are you showing this gesture? And the Holy Prophet said, Alaysat Nafsan, was he not a human being? So instead of dividing between Jews, Christians, Muslim, or ethnicities, respect every human being just for the fact that he's a human being. So that's uh, what the message, that was the message I conveyed, and that's where Miguel, he turned up, and uh, he introduced himself, and he said, look, I want to start a program, Shalom Salam, on my radio. And that was a humble beginning, and um, for us it was just, in the beginning we thought it's going to be exchanged once a week for one hour, but over the time I think uh, it happens that during the day even, I speak more to Miguel than to my wife. <laughs> so, uh, obviously we have, uh, <laughs> we have, we cover not only the sweet topics, but also many differences, uh, especially when there are always conflicts. So at one point, uh, I think it was back in 21, when there was again some conflicts and issues going on. And that's when we met up again. And we said, what should we do now? Should we continue? Because in times of peace, it's easy to speak about shalom, salam. Um, and then we decided, yes, we're going to continue. We're not going to import the conflicts, rather keep on working on our brotherhood. And remember, we were sitting in Buenos Aires in a neighborhood, and people started taking pictures of us. And many people approached us and taking selfies, and some of them even had tears in their eyes. And they said, it's just giving us so much hope, seeing them in this times of uh, conflict and war and hate, you being united. And that's where we decided that we have to move on and uh, keep on 
spreading this message of Shalom Salam. So, Rabbi Sturman, I, I want to hear more f about the story from your perspective, but also h how you found this work to be most impactful, right? How do you, what, what makes this work penetrate the hearts and minds of the people that you try to communicate with? What drives you to do this work? First of all, it's okay? Yeah. I want to thank so much to, find, to having us here and... Uh, I don't bring my translator, <laughs> and uh, I have a deal with the Ahmadi, my brothers and uh, cousin. Yesterday, I have a deal with them, and I want to add you with you. I don't speak about how they are speaking Spanish. Please don't take us uh, me uh, how I speak English. Huh? My, my my English. You can uh, speak Hebrew, and the rabbi you can translate. Translate this, <laughs> this <laughs> Spanish, of course. <laughs> no, it's, a, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be, and thanks really to, to have us here. Uh, and when I listen to so many important words uh, that you before said, I think that uh, if we remember the genocide, when God created the world, he created uh, not uh, Jews, not Muslim, not Christian, human being. And uh, I don't choose really to be a Jew. That was <laughs> something that uh, occurs and happens. And of course to Marwan too, to be a Muslim and a Christian, that's what happens. But before that we are uh, part of these teams and we like to be part of teams, we are part of one only team that is the humanity. And I want to say clearly that uh, it's a difference between religions and spiritua spirituality. And we need to make very serious and deep to, to work in our spirituality more than about uh, what the religion's rules say exactly, because we are, we are part of one team. If we are not understand that, we have really a, pro a, a problem. And if you permit me, because my English is not so good, uh, I listen to so many good things, and I think that in that uh, meeting it's good, uh, and my brother liked that, uh, to ask you to, a minute, a minute, to pray and to sing together. You, of course, know that. Heveinu shalom alechem. Heveinu shalom alechem. Heveinu shalom alechem. Heveinu shalom, shalom, shalom alechem. We bring you peace. We bring you to the peace. We bring you, you the peace. We bring you, 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 you the peace. We bring you salam alaikum. We bring you salam alaikum. We bring you salam alaikum. We bring you salam, salam, salam alaikum. If we can sing together, if we can pray together, we can choose the sanctity of life to understand what is really important, what's really made the difference. And to end that part, the most important prayer in the Jewish um, prayer, it's called the Amidah. We are standing and we are praying Amidah. How is the Amidah ending? I, every time say that we are ending and saying Ose shalom bimromav huya se shalom aleinu Israel. when we are seeing that we are say that we are coming two steps back the peace all it's possible if everyone is coming two steps back to make possible to the another one to have place 
you, we need to understand that we don't have the true. The true is all in God. And we need to come back a little for our thinking that we have the real true. We are coming, everyone, for an, another narrative. I received the narrative from my childhood for the Jewish heritage with all what they tell me about, of course, our story. And I'm sure that uh, the Muslim community, and in that time I need to say the Ahmadiyya community is the elite of Islam. And I hope that the Islam is coming much more to be closer to the Ahmadi vision of love to the others because everyone has in his family, you know, we are dysfunctional families. We have some brothers that we don't uh, want them so much to be part of, but it's part of our reality. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You. Uh, this is wonderful. Um, this is an amazing story, and I'm gonna uh, just say that, you know, if you go in this International Religious Freedom Summit, is at the Washington Hilton, and across the street is a mosque, and the rabbi and imam are staying together for that, for in, at that mosque for the next four days. This is just the embodiment of what this movement means and why we are convening here tonight. So thank you so much for that. I wanna uh, now invite our three panelists uh, who are experts in their own right. If you don't mind coming up here and playing a little bit of musical chairs. Um, I'm gonna introduce their bios while we make that switch. Knox Thames is a senior visiting expert with the Religion and Inclusive Society teams at United States Institute for Peace. He's held several key positions advocating for freedom of religion or belief, including at the State Department and two different U.S. government foreign policy commissions. He's an international human rights lawyer and advocate doing a lot of work. Nadine Mayenza is a global fellow at the Wilson Center and the president of the Earth Secretariat, an international organization that convenes the round table in Washington, D.C., and over 30 round tables globally, a noted speaker, writer, and policy exer expert with more than two decades of experience as an advocate for working families and a champion for international religious freedom. She convened an amazing event this morning. Many of you attended that. Fernanda San Martin Carrasco, She's a former member of the parliament in Bolivia and now serves as director of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief, a network of parliamentarians and legislators from around the world committed to combating religious persecution and advancing freedom of religion or belief. And delighted to have you come all the way and travel here for this event. So another stellar panel and a different perspective that we wanted to kind of close with. Um, each of you have now heard from religious actors, people working in the space, but each of you have also seen this space from the perspective of policy and change. So uh, perhaps I'll begin uh, with you, Nadine. Okay. You've traveled the world, you've met a lot of people, you have tremendous interfaith experience. And going back to that question again, religion can be perceived as a force of division. Mm -hmm. And yet, religion is really not the problem, it's the solution. Right. How do you, in your own right, approach this work, and what have you seen in your conversations to, to see if you can ask or answer that question of whether this perception can really be changed? You know, it's so interesting you say that, because um, coming from the evangelical community, I often am challenged, like you're sitting at the table with other religions. And, and, and there's just a confusion about what that looks like and why. And you know, at the Earth Roundtable, you, you know, we, we, we're not looking for common ground when we sit with people with different religious backgrounds. We're actually bringing our, we, we encourage you bring your whole self, your whole religion, everything you believe, wholly. You don't compromise it, you don't change it, and then you accept the person sitting next to you, the humanity of who they are, even though they have a religious belief that's completely different than yours. And um, so for me, it's, it, it makes all the sense in the world to accept one another and also being a Christian to be salt and light in the world and show the world what Christianity is supposed to look like, which is accepting one another and humanity, which of course we see the Ahmadiyyas, the beautiful love not hate. I mean, there's so many threads that are common among our religious communities. And really, 
I think the key, we've heard this before up here, is, is standing up for one another. I mean, that's when it is so beautiful. I was just in Uzbekistan um, a couple days ago. <laughs> I got back on Thursday. And I met with a pastor um, of a very tiny church in a region that doesn't have um, very, any other registered churches. And, and one of our delegation asked him, who do you call when you have a problem? And he said, up until a, couple year, a year ago, when the grand imam retired, I would call the grand imam. And I'm just, we're just like, what? And find out that he had been at a multi-faith event run by the Institute for Global Engagement, where they brought together imams and pastors. And now this tiny church had access to the green, grand imam in a country that's 98% Muslim, or 96% Muslim, depending on which numbers. And so those are the kind of things that you make way for everybody. Instead of being in that silo, like we was talking about um, Archbishop Angeles, we can't live in a silo, and we, we, we need those people that are, that are kind of marginalized in that silo to be able to bring them all together and help them to be able to sit together. And that's really what we're doing by convening people is not being in charge, not telling people what to do, just giving the opportunity to take people out of those silos so they can all stand up for one another. And I've seen that, I've seen you do this, um, and it's amazing to see the difference that makes, right? Just getting out of your comfort zone, visiting, and you know, they, there's an old adage, it's hard to hate someone up close, Yeah. right? And that's true. Um, just, you know, it's, there's a lot of ignorance, but if you actually visit and be in the environment that the person is in, that's when you really understand and can empathize and sympathize. Um, Knox, you have had the opportunity to kind of navigate a number of worlds in the space and met a lot of people. And I'm curious your thoughts and observations about this perception, especially now, and having visiting so many people, do you, how do you sound a note of optimism? It's hard, but I think it's crucial that those of us in the fight for religious freedom for all continue to have a sense of hope. I'm always, always uh, hark back to the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who said that the, talks about the moral arc of the universe bending towards justice. And here was someone who had faced the worst kind of prejudice and violence, and yet was committed to lifting up his community, challenging our country to live up to our founding our ideals. I think that's a spirit we need to bring into this work. Um, you know, when you think about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and people say, well, it, it, it was good for a time, but now there's too much conflict, there's too much destruction, there's too much hatred, it doesn't work. Well, I'd like to remind all of us that in a certain sense, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is an interfaith document. The committee that Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt convened brought people together of all different types of backgrounds, cultures, religions, to, to do the hard work of enumerating human rights for people everywhere. It founded on the concept of common dignity. It was also born out of a time of war. It, it literally arose out of the ashes of the Holocaust, the worst uh, uh, genocide a uh, community had ever faced with what was targeted against Jews and others in Europe. The UDHR fits today. It fits for our work and it's based upon rooms like this, people coming together. We may have dis different disagreements on, on uh, the eternal, but we agree that every person, because of human dignity, has the right to pursue truth as their conscience leads. And we may disagree on where that goes, but we agree on that right. And that's where strength comes from. That's where the strength in this room comes from. But I also want to hark back to a couple of comments others said on the previous panel. While it's great we're working together, we also need to be working with our own community. We need to be challenging our own brothers and sisters and our own faith groups to be reaching a hand, of, uh, reaching a hand out to others. Um, something I'm working on with my program at Pepperdine University, which is a Christian university, is to build a network called Christians Against All Persecution. We're trying to build a biblical narrative based on the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus challenged his followers to go and do likewise, to help those in need regardless of their race, religion, or ethnicity. And that's something I want my church to be known for. And I think it's incumbent that we all work with our own spaces to challenge our own brothers and sisters based on our own sacred scriptures to, to extend a hand, to find a way to lead so that we can all step forward based on a common appreciation of human dignity and human rights. Challenging perceptions, very, very thoughtful comments. Uh, Fernanda, you have been a member of parliament. 
you work with member of par members of parliament, you're working in the right space, you've worked in spaces where you want governments to act to redress injustices. How does interfaith fit in all of that? Well, thank you first for the invitation, Matt, and thank you, Katrina. Um, first of all, I, I think, well, politicians are a very particular public, <laughs> as you well know. Uh, it is very difficult when you have a polarization all over the world, and we've seen it from politics to society go through. And we, we started as a very, very small network of parliamentarians. Now we are more than 300 members, uh, more than 95 countries all around the world. And how to overcome those, uh, those differences, political differences, because one of the things that we, we cherish very much in our network is to build a network with values of non-discrimination and the value of diversity. And that is very important to us. One of the only things that we um, ask for our members to do is to the commitment of Article 18. You were talking about the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Nox, and that is exactly what we ask our members, just to be uh, committed to that uh, specific Article 18 of freedom of religion or belief. And why? Because. Uh, we want a diverse network. I think that diversity, it is our strength. And that is how I think we should see it um, in society, in politics. To build those bridges, we need a nonpartisan network as we build, but also with uh, solidarity. And the diversity that we are talking about is a diversity, not only political diversity, but also religious diversity and geographical diversity. And that, I think, that can help because, uh, of course, it is about acceptance, about understanding the other. And maybe uh, politicians and members of parliament will not agree in 90% of the things that, uh, because they come from different political backgrounds, but at least this cause needs to be very nonpartisan, crossing bridges, because it's a human right, because we're talking about sufferance of human beings, and I think that is one of, of the things that, can, that makes our global network unique because uh, parliamentarians can um, really engage with other parliamentarians from different parts of the world where there is sufferance. Maybe, for example, in Latin America, we don't have such big cases of persecution. Uh, only a few, well, of course, Argentina, what happened with the uh, with attack of AMIA. But I think that, for example, when you put it uh, and you compare to other regions, you can see that there is no such big issues. So what happens when, how to reach that parliamentarian for, for example, Latin America, and to engage into the work or into um, what is going on in other regions? Um, we had, for example, a fact-finding mission in Nepal where there was um, uh, the controversial um, modification of the penal code. So they were going to um, penalize those who wanted to reconvert into another religion. And it was uh, a fact-finding mission of more than 15 uh, members of different parliaments from all around the world. And they start, well, having meetings, meeting uh, the persecuted, meeting also politicians and members of parliament from, from Nepal and trying to make them understand uh, how to build that trust, you, what we were saying the, in, the, in the panel before. And I think that trust is, mo is one of the most important values. So, and then that, ha that helped also to uh, understand how they can build a different uh, penal code, how to also be in touch and uh, networking with another parliamentarians and to know that they are not alone in their in their battle, that they have other parliamentarians that can be uh, partners and allies to really address those kind of, uh, of issues around the world. Very good. Um, I mean, this is real expertise. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to say that each of these individuals who spoke today, the eight panelists, will be here for the Religious Freedom Summit. For those of you who would like to have carry on these conversations, we're here towards the end now, and um, I wanted to tur turn to our co-chair for the International Religious Freedom Summit, 
Ambassador Sam Brownback, uh, who incubated uh, this idea to bring everyone together. Most of us are indebted to him for his ability to really galvanize the interfaith community in a way that's programmatic, that's meaningful, that's precise, that's effective, that's uni unifying. These are all the themes that we hope to have imparted this evening. So I think it would be very fitting to ask Ambassador, I know he's been fighting a cold to share a few words, if he can, with his hoarse voice, but I think he can. Thank you. I think I cheered for the Chiefs too much yesterday, my problem. And I don't mean to offend any Baltimore or Divide people. Um, I would said earlier today that this is our fourth annual um, Earth Summit. And I said instead of annual, it's really cumulative because the first three, each of them were like in a big jet heading down a runway and we're building up speed. This fourth one, we're going to take off. Uh, and this is part of the takeoff. Instead of just having meetings on the Hill, we've got seven pieces of legislation or resolutions or letters that are substantive and specific that people are getting behind and say, let's pass this bill. Let's do this. Because we've got to start really showing people these things can happen. We can move things positive. You're talking about things that you're positive. These are, these are, uh, are positive actions. And that's what we've got to show. And that's what we've got to move forward. And time is short. We've got so much conflict in the world. If we don't really get things punching now, uh, we, we can miss the moment altogether. So I, I applaud this effort and this day. Amja, your work with it. Uh, Drew, that a number of you know, helped put this together. Uh, had to leave, he's sick. Uh, and, but he just believes in the cause so much. He had to be here this morning and uh, pray for his health that he gets, uh, gets better, and I think he will. Um, but that's just how much passion there is in this. That's how much push we've got behind it. And this is how much work we have to do. Uh, so keep, keep leaning into it the way you are. It's deeply appreciated. Uh, and we just, God bless you for it. Keep pushing forward. Thank you all. Thank you, Ambassador. I encourage everyone here to carry on the conversations. I just wanted to acknowledge there are so many people who are here from different faith communities. Um, I was told that um, Adrian Santelli from the Catholic Church in Argentina is here. Um, I see our dear friend, the Imam, there he is. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Imam Sharif is here from Washington, DC. We're so happy that you're here. Thank you so much. So many other different faith communities. I'm looking at my brothers and sisters in the back here. Thank you so much for coming. This is why we're here. And I hope you enjoy this Religious Freedom Summit and carry these conversations forward. Religious freedom for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Thank you. <laughs>